So when we last left Jesus last week in the synagogue, <coughs> and again we heard this morning, after he had read to the gathered Nazarenes the promises of the kingdom of God from the Isaiah scripture, he said that the gospel had been fulfilled in their hearing. So we have two paths that we can take here as I see it. You may see more or less. But both end up in the same place. The edge of a cliff. Path number one. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Our boy has come home. We have a prophet in our midst. Little old Nazareth has its own prophet. Finally, Finally, we have something to brag about. Path number two. Isn't this the son of Joseph? Who is he to tell us what has and hasn't been fulfilled in our hearing? Is he insinuating that God's fulfillment has come about because of him, a carpenter's son? We know who the Messiah is, and he ain't the Messiah. <laughs> now I have a feeling that both of those paths were followed at that time, that place in Nazareth, at that synagogue. Then Jesus stirs the pot by telling them what he thinks they might be thinking. You know how to do that. <laughs> I certainly do. <laughs> Doctor. Surely you will say, Doctor, heal yourself and do for us what you did in Capernaum. Heal yourself before telling others what they are sick and need to be cured from. Is that what Jesus is saying? Is that what they're hearing from Jesus' little comment? Don't give us directions as to what God is telling us to do. If you're so good at being a prophet, let us see you do something with it. Pull a rabbit out of your hat. Remember, we know who you are, Joseph's son. That might be what they think Jesus is insinuating with that comment. Then he even stirs the pot more. And this was the final straw, even for those who initially found his words gentle and comforting. This is where the outright rejection of Jesus by his townspeople culminates in the threat of violence. Jesus says, A prophet isn't a prophet in his own land. A prophet who carries the acceptable message of God isn't acceptable in his own land. As I see it, this is what he's saying to them. You local yokels couldn't tell a prophet if he sat down in front of you and started prophesying. I'm living proof. <laughs> and Jesus continues to stir the pot. The Lord's benevolence, the Lord's good work, the Lord's salvation is open to all, not just to you. But you wouldn't listen. God sent the sent the prophets Elijah and Elijah to minister to the Gentiles, passing you over even when you were in need. God's prophetic mission is for all. At that point, the people become murderous toward Jesus when he tells them that God does not have an exclusive contract with them, but he escapes being thrown over the cliff by disappearing into the crowd. So what happened here? Well, what happened was that what Jesus said wasn't the way they understood the kingdom of God, the Messiah's message for what stayed along. One of the things Luke is telling us with this story is that the people's rage at Jesus is all about the limits. It's all about how they set limits on God. And Luke is telling us it's all about how we 
set limits on God. Our expectation of what the kingdom of God is. The Nazarenes had an expectation of God, and guess what? It was all about them. Well, guess what? We think it's all about us. <laughs> we all set limits on God and God's kingdom. Now, as an example, right, one that came to mind quickly was concerning our more conservative, fundamentalist, and literalist brothers and sisters and the limit that I see that they set on God. In my home state of Kentucky, there is a creation museum. I'm a big theme park to go with it. <laughs> now, in this creation museum, man and dinosaur walks the earth at the same time. They say evolution is impossible because it doesn't fit their contextual time scale. It doesn't fit the time annex or whatever watch brand they're wearing <coughs> on the wrist. It doesn't fit, therefore it can't be true. But after talking to some of our younger brothers and sisters who attend schools in the area, evolution has made its way in, believe it or not. But it still all had to happen in 6,000 years. <laughs> God's time is limited to a time next. But my brothers and sisters, I would be greatly remiss in my duties. I would be like someone wanting to throw Jesus off the cliff if I didn't ask this question. How do I, how do we, the more advanced and progressive types. <laughs> and yes, you should take that with sarcasm. <laughs> How do we limit God? How do we think that God has an exclusive contract with us? Surely we don't limit him by our chronometers on our wrist. Surely not. We never get anxious about time, do we? <laughs> oh, let me name the ways we might limit God. Miraculous healings that are not scientifically possible. I've certainly wrestled with that one. God's blessings from giving out of perceived scarcity or real scarcity. Are those blessings real? Are they questionable? Is that really the right thing to do out of scarcity? <clears throat> Is to give? Real presence. Real presence here at the altar during communion. Is Christ present in the Eucharist? We say God is the ruler of the universe, but some of us don't really think God could be in that little piece of bread that we eat, and certainly not in that compressed wafer. <laughs> and in that little sip of wine, why, it's only symbolic. <coughs> but are we limiting God by thinking that? Are we limiting God through our prayers that we pray, or our lack of praying? Do we try to limit God by not understanding and not wanting to understand that the grace of the sacrament comes from God and not by the piety of the priest? Do we really believe that Christ can be seen in everyone or only those who believe like we do? Can Christ be seen in the face of a Muslim? And can Christ be seen in those who society detests? Can Christ
Christ's face be seen in the pedophile? How are we limiting Christ's movement in this world? Since we are his hands and feet commissioned to do his ministry until he returns. Are there some in need, even if it has been through bad choices? that we will not venture toward, though we are called to minister to all. Maybe we should throw Christ off the cliff, cliff for asking us to do that. Does any one of us really believe that Republicans or Democrats can be devoid of deep faith and the love of God just by their voting history? Setting limits on God hurts our fellow journeyers and diminishes us in the eyes of heaven, even as our own selves are inflated in our eyes. The good news from Luke is that God's salvation is for all. His ministry through us is intended for all. The good news for the salvation of humankind and this is really good news, is that even if we fail, and we will, and we will again, even if we fail and place limits on the expectation of God's kingdom, salvation will be done. God's grace happens with or without us. Our limitations on God and our limited understanding of how God a limiting understanding of God will not stop God. The good news is that God offers us transformation despite the limits we place upon God. God offers us love, and God's love is never ending. And without God's love, we are nothing. Lord, we pray, help us to remove the limits we place on love. Amen. Amen. Amen.